Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Imagine moving into your dream home only to be confronted with unexplainable, terrifying phenomena. For LaToya Ammons and her family, this nightmare became a reality in 2011 when they moved into a modest house in Gary, Indiana. What started with an unusual swarm of black flies soon escalated into a series of chilling events, including mysterious footsteps, violent attacks, and even levitation. The Ammons family claimed they were plagued by over 200 demons, turning their lives into a living horror story that drew the attention of media, church officials, and even paranormal investigators. As the story of the House of 200 Demons spread, it became a media sensation, captivating the public with its dark and macabre details. From exorcisms performed by a Catholic priest to the involvement of child services and law enforcement, the case was shrouded in mystery and controversy. Paranormal enthusiasts and skeptics alike have debated the validity of the Ammons family's claims, with some attributing the events to supernatural forces and others suggesting psychological or environmental explanations. Either way, it is one of the most extraordinary haunting cases in recent history. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In 1764, the peaceful region of Gévaudan, France was plunged into terror by a series of brutal attacks attributed to a mysterious beast. As the creature's deadly rampage continued, whispers of a werewolf and sensational newspaper reports fueled a nationwide hysteria. Whatever the beast of Gévaudan was, the true story still haunts the people living there. In 1990, a horrifying mass shooting at the Las Cruces bowling alley left four people dead and three others wounded, including children. Despite multiple eyewitnesses and extensive investigations, the killers remain at large. New York City, where ghostly apparitions and haunted landmarks abound. From the infamous Dakota Building to the chilling tales of Washington Square Park, New York is one of the most haunted cities in the world. We'll look at just a few ghostly locations in the Big Apple. When William W. Place remarried, he hoped for a loving and stable household. However, his new wife Martha quickly showed her true colors, leading to tragic consequences. It's a tale of jealousy, violence, and ends with the first woman executed by electric chair in the U.S. Imagine dancing non-stop for days, weeks, or even months, all for a chance to win food and money during the Great Depression. Dance marathons pushed contestants to their physical and mental limits, turning a simple competition into a shocking spectacle of endurance and desperation. But first, from mysterious swarms of flies to terrifying levitations and violent attacks, the Ammons family haunting is one of the most terrifying cases of demonic possession in recent history. Allegedly, believers and skeptics are still arguing over its authenticity. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, 
and come with me into the weird darkness. For centuries, the notion of demonic possession has haunted humankind. The idea that sinister forces from beyond could take control of individuals is chilling enough, but what if an entire house could become a portal for these evil entities? One recent case claims just that. A family and their home were allegedly infiltrated by demons or even the devil himself, leading to one of the most terrifying accounts on record the Demon House of Indiana. In November 2011, Latoya Ammons, her mother Rosa Campbell, and her three children, ages 7, 9, and 12, moved into a modest home at 3860 Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. At first, they were happy in their new home, a plain-looking rental cottage that represented a fresh start. However, soon after moving in, they began experiencing strange and ominous phenomena that hinted at something sinister residing in their new home. In December, the family noticed an unusual number of black flies buzzing and crawling around the house, especially on the small porch. This was particularly odd because it was winter, a time when flies should be scarce. The flies would sometimes swarm in thick black clouds, despite there being no obvious reason for them to gather there. The neighbors did not have any fly problems. Despite the family's efforts to exterminate them, the flies kept coming back. Rosa Campbell lamented, This is not normal. We killed them and killed them and killed them, but they kept coming back. Unfortunately, the flies were just the beginning. Around the same time, the family started hearing heavy footsteps coming from the basement at night, along with the creaking sound of the basement door opening, even when it was locked. They even found wet boot prints left behind. In addition to these noises, there were numerous cases of poltergeist activity, such as slamming doors and moving objects. On one occasion, Campbell saw a dark figure lurking in the living room, which vanished in the blink of an eye. There was also an incident where a religious statue in the home was smashed to pieces. The paranormal activity steadily grew in intensity, causing the Ammons children to miss school because they were kept awake all night by the strange occurrences. The situation escalated further when various family members began to experience physical attacks. Campbell claimed that she had been viciously choked by invisible hands. The older son was reportedly thrown across the room as if he were a rag doll, and the youngest son was allegedly thrown from the bathroom. The daughter was also thrown around and grabbed by dark shadows. In March 2012, the twelve-year-old daughter was found levitating over her bed in a trance-like state. Ammons and Campbell prayed, and the girl eventually floated back down. Upon waking, she had no memory of the incident. After this terrifying event, the children began exhibiting strange behaviors that suggested they were under the influence of some demonic force. Their eyes would bulge or roll back into their heads, and they would hiss snarl and bark like animals with no memory of it afterward. They sometimes spoke in demonic voices or passed out for no reason, during which they could not be woken up. One of the sons would sometimes blurt out sinister remarks like, I will kill you or it's time to die, in a voice that wasn't his own. He was even accused of attacking his brother during these episodes. Ammons herself claimed to have been possessed on occasion. Desperate for help, Ammons reached out to the church. When priests investigated, they reportedly witnessed a wide variety of paranormal occurrences, including demonic possession in the children, flickering lights, and moving objects. A bottle allegedly levitated across the room. The church advised the family to cleanse the house and draw crosses on the floors and windows, but nothing helped. Clairvoyance told Ammons that her home was infested by at least 200 demons. They burned sage and made an altar in the basement, but the family was too poor to move away. Eventually, the Department of Child Services DCS, became involved. One of the case managers, Valerie Washington, reportedly witnessed a supernatural event. One of the Ammons boys walked backward up a wall, flipped over her, and stood there. 
She later said, there's no way he could have done that. I believe that it was something going on there that was out of the realm of a normal living person. Even the authorities were convinced something strange was happening. Police Captain Charles Austin witnessed several strange events, including taking photos with phantom shapes, capturing a mysterious voice on tape, and experiencing car and garage door malfunctions. Despite this, the Ammons children were taken from their mother for six months while DCS investigated. They were eventually returned to her. The story of the House of 200 Demons gained widespread attention after being reported in high-profile news outlets, including a comprehensive 2014 article in the Indianapolis Star and another in the New York Daily News. This media coverage propelled the dramatic affair into the public imagination, making it a media sensation. In the meantime, Catholic priest Rev. Michael Maginot performed three exorcisms on the house and the victims, calling it a portal of demons. The activity only stopped when the family moved away to Indianapolis. The story, however, took another turn when Zach Baggins from the Travel Channel TV show Ghost Adventures purchased the house. He filmed a documentary on the Ammons case and his own experiences at the property, titled Demon House. Baggins bought the home, accessed reams of information, interviewed witnesses, and even brought back Reverend Maginot. However, Ammons herself distanced from the incident. Baggins reported falling seriously ill within the first week of buying the house. Maginot advised using crucifixes and spiritual protection, but Baggins refused, wanting to experience the full demonic presence. Numerous technical difficulties, freak accidents, and even a crew member's exorcism occurred during filming. Baggins remarked, this film is cursed, and worried that merely watching it could be dangerous. After filming wrapped in 2016, Baggins had the house torn down, leaving an empty lot. Maginot believed this was a mistake, claiming the evil still lingered there. Without a cleansing ritual, the property's status as a demon portal remained, regardless of the house's presence. People still reported performing rituals there, opening themselves to danger. Maginot lamented, I didn't want people harmed. It's dangerous. It's not an amusement park. There's a danger that you can't control. Despite the chilling accounts, skepticism surrounds the case. Some believe Ammon's religious background and troubled home life influenced her perceptions. Skeptic Joe Nickel debunked the case in an article for the Skeptical Inquirer, offering rational explanations for many of the events. He noted that many witnesses were superstitious believers in the paranormal, and some photographs and recordings had logical explanations. Nichols suggested that some dramatic events were misreported or sensationalized, and financial gain may have motivated some involved. He concluded, no demons possessed anyone in this case. What were really unleashed were the dark aspects of superstition, ancient dogma, lust for notoriety, the greed of cynical hucksters, and the stubborn unwillingness of some to be reasoned with. Despite skepticism, Ammons and her family maintain their story is true and beyond rational explanation, as do others involved, including Baggins. Many witnesses claim to have seen these phenomena, leaving us to wonder if they are all mistaken. The Demon House of Indiana remains one of the most spectacular demonic possession cases of recent time, leaving the truth of what happened open to interpretation. We'll leave it up to you to decide if you believe the Ammon story or not. When Weird Darkness Returns In 1990, a horrifying mass shooting at the Las Cruces bowling alley left four people dead and three others wounded, including children. Despite multiple eyewitnesses and extensive investigations, the killers remain at large. Plus, New York City, where ghostly apparitions and haunted landmarks abound. From the infamous Dakota Building to the chilling tales of Washington Square Park, New York is one of the most haunted cities in the world. We'll look at just a few ghostly locations in the Big Apple. But first, when William W. Place remarried, he hoped for a loving and stable household. However, his new wife Martha quickly showed her true colors, 
leading to tragic consequences. It's a tale of jealousy, violence, and it ends with the first woman executed by electric chair in the U.S. That story is up next. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. When William W. Place's first wife died, he wanted to remarry quickly. He was looking for a mature woman who could keep the house tidy and, most importantly, take care of his young daughter Ida. In 1893, he hired Martha Savcole, a widow from New Brunswick, New Jersey, to work as a servant in their Brooklyn home. William was pleased with her work, and she seemed to care a lot for Ida. Soon, William started showing her more attention and within a couple of months, they were seen together at the theater. After a short and intense courtship, despite his relatives' warnings that she might cause trouble, William married Martha Savcole. Their concerns soon proved true. Martha had a quick temper and often fought with other family members. She was upset that William had put the house in Ida's name. She wanted her adopted son to live with them, which William refused. The biggest problem was Martha's jealousy over William's affection for his daughter. Ida loved to play the piano, often accompanied by her father, who had a fine tenor voice. They also enjoyed taking photos together. Martha resented their bond and once remarked, Ida and her father will be married someday, I suppose. As time passed, Martha's affection for Ida turned into open hostility. By 1898, when Ida was 17, Martha was openly hostile. She threatened to kill both William and Ida, and her late-night temper tantrums often forced them to leave the house. They had to call a doctor multiple times to give her sedatives. On February 8, 1898, after William left for work, neighbors heard loud arguing from the place home. Around 9 a.m., their servant, Helen Tom, heard Ida screaming and ran upstairs. Martha sent her back down, saying, never mind, we've only had a little quarrel. Later that day, Martha fired Helen, saying that they were breaking up housekeeping and no longer needed her help. The house remained quiet, with all the curtains closed for the rest of the day. William returned from work at 6.30 p.m., and shortly after entering the house, a neighbor saw him run out with blood streaming from his head. My wife shot me, William said. She has shot me in the head, and if I do not get the bullet out, I'll die. It wasn't a gunshot. He had been hit twice in the head with a hatchet. The attack was so sudden and shocking that he thought he had been shot. An ambulance was called, and the police arrived and had to break into the house. They found Martha on the floor with broken gas lamps spewing gas into the room. She appeared to be unconscious, but the doctor believed she was faking it. Ida was found upstairs, lying on her bed. She had been strangled to death. There had been a fierce struggle. Ida had used scissors to defend herself, and Martha's dress was ripped and slashed. Ida's eyes were swollen and discolored, as if Martha had tried to gouge them out. The doctor believed Ida had been dead since early that morning. 
Martha was taken to the hospital because of her apparent suicide attempt, but was soon released into police custody. Detective Becker took her back to her home, where Ida's body still lay on the bed. Look at Ida, he said, and deny, if you will, that you killed her. Martha looked down and closed her eyes. She reportedly said, My God, I did it. Take me away. Take me away. But when she was taken to court and charged with homicide, assault, and attempted suicide, she said, I didn't do anything of the kind. Martha's trial began on July 5, 1898. Her defense was insanity. The trial lasted four days, and she was easily convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to die. The verdict was appealed but upheld. Martha Place became the first woman executed by electric chair. Her case sparked debate over whether it was appropriate to execute a woman this way or at all. A bill was introduced in the state legislature to make life imprisonment the maximum sentence for a woman convicted of first-degree murder, but it failed. Women's rights advocate Elizabeth Cady Stanton defended Martha, saying she should not be executed because, as a woman, she had no voice in the laws, no representation in the government, and was as helpless as cats or dogs in the hands of vivisectionists outside the realm of justice and mercy. Governor Theodore Roosevelt wasn't convinced by this argument, but he did convene a committee of doctors to examine Martha Place and ensure that she was sane enough to execute. The committee found her sane, and on March 20, 1899, Martha Place was executed at Sing Sing Prison, becoming the first woman in the U.S. to be executed by electrocution. New York City, often called the city that never sleeps, has a long and storied history filled with mysterious and eerie tales. From high-rise apartment buildings to ancient cemeteries and historic parks, the ghosts of New York City are said to haunt every corner. With its large population, rich history, and stunning architecture, it's no surprise that New York City is considered one of the most haunted cities in the world. Here are some of the creepiest legends and ghost stories that make NYC a spooky place to visit. One of the most famous haunted locations in New York City is the Dakota, where John Lennon once lived and was tragically killed. The building is reportedly haunted by several ghosts, including a woman known as the Crying Lady, whom Lennon himself claimed to have seen wandering the halls. Lennon also reported seeing a UFO outside his window while living there. After his death, the spirit was reportedly seen by his wife Yoko Ono, sitting at a piano and comforting her by saying, don't be afraid, I am still with you. Musician Joey Harrow and writer Amanda Moores have also claimed to see Lennon's ghost near the entrance of the Dakota, surrounded by an eerie light. Other ghostly sightings include a mysterious little girl playing with the ball and a boy in a Buster Brown suit. Frederick and Suzanne Weinstein, who lived in an apartment on the third floor, reported phantom footsteps, moving furniture, and an incident where a large crystal chandelier appeared to glow in their window before disappearing. The White Horse Tavern, a favorite bar of poet Dylan Thomas, is said to be haunted by his spirit. Thomas drank himself into a coma at the tavern in 1953 and later died. Patrons and staff claim to see his ghost sitting at his usual table, possibly waiting for another drink. The 130-year-old Kreischer Mansion on Staten Island has a dark and haunted history. Built in 1885 by Balthasar Kreischer, many members of the Kreischer family perished there, and their spirits are said to linger. Edward and Charles Kreischer, Balthasar's sons, fought bitterly after their father's death, with Edward allegedly taking his own life after an argument. Charles and his wife later died in a house fire, and both men are believed to haunt the mansion. Other spirits said to haunt the Kreischer mansion include a German cook, the ghosts of children, and victims of a mob hit that took place inside the house. One particularly gruesome incident involved Robert McKelvey, 
a member of the Bonanno crime family who was murdered on the property in 2005. His body was dismembered and burned, adding to the mansion's haunted reputation. The One If By Land, Two If By Sea restaurant in the West Village is known for its delicious food and its 20 restless spirits. Originally a carriage house dating back to 1767, it is haunted by several ghosts, including Aaron Burr and his daughter, Theodosia. Theodosia is known for her mischievous behavior, such as pushing a maitre d' down the stairs and pulling earrings off female guests. Other ghosts include a Ziegfeld Follies girl who haunts the back room, a man seen by the fireplace, and another ghost near the front door. Plates fly, picture frames tilt, machinery activates itself and lights flicker. Waiters have even tried to serve ghostly patrons who vanished before their eyes. Located in Astoria, the Museum of the Moving Image is haunted by disembodied footsteps and the deep voice of an unseen man. A full-bodied apparition of a woman dressed in white has been seen after hours, often near the security desk. Her identity remains a mystery, adding to the museum's eerie atmosphere. The Merchant's House Museum, a historical landmark, looks exactly as it did when the Treadwell family lived there over a hundred years ago. Gertrude Treadwell, who spent her entire life in the house, is believed to haunt it. Visitors and staff have reported hearing her footsteps in her former bedroom and seeing her spirit in the front yard. One famous story involves neighborhood kids playing in the yard just weeks after Gertrude's death in 1933. Witnesses saw her ghost chase the children away. Another incident in 1995 involved a judicial department official speaking of a tattered and musty gentleman who vanished suddenly, believed to be the long-departed Samuel Treadwell. Edgar Allan Poe, the famous horror writer, seems to haunt many places in New York City. His former building in Greenwich Village has mostly been demolished, but one original banister remains. Poe's ghost is said to climb this banister, earning it the title of most haunted banister in New York. In Soho, the COS shop sits atop an 18th century well linked to a gruesome, unsolved case. In 1799, Guillermo Elmore Sands was found suffocated in the well after planning to elope with her lover, Levi Weeks. Though Weeks was acquitted, the real killer was never found. The well is now said to be haunted, with bottles flying off shelves and people feeling uneasy near it. Once a burial ground with over 20,000 bodies, many victims of yellow fever, Washington Square Park is believed to be haunted. Apparitions in 18th century clothing are seen strolling through the park. The hangman's elm, an old tree in the park, is said to have been used for hangings, including that of Rose Butler, who burned down the house where she worked. A shadowy figure is often seen swinging from the elm at night. Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, with its Gothic architecture and 478 acres of graves, is naturally considered haunted. Before becoming a cemetery in 1838, the land saw a grisly conflict in 1776. Visitors report seeing ghostly figures, strange gusts of wind, and capturing apparitions in photos. One notable ghost is Mabel Douglas, whose body was found at the bottom of Lake Placid 30 years after her disappearance. She is now buried in Greenwood, where people claim to see her spirit. The catacombs, usually closed to the public, are open around Halloween for a haunted attraction. Adding to the eerie atmosphere, a person dressed as a creepy clown carrying balloons has been seen lurking around the cemetery. The Hotel Chelsea, a favorite among rock stars, artists, and celebrities, is also popular with ghosts. Sid Vicious, the bassist for the Sex Pistols, and his girlfriend Nancy Spungen are among the most famous ghostly residents. Nancy was found dead in their hotel room in 1978, and Sid died of a heroin overdose while awaiting trial for her murder. Many claim the couple still haunts the hotel. The Hellgate Bridge, spanning the East River, is haunted by a demonic ghost train that blares through at night, searching for souls to take. The train is said to collect those who perish in the waters below. 
NYU's Brittany Residence Hall is infamous for its haunting. In 1929, a girl named Molly fell down an elevator shaft when the building was a hotel. Her ghost has reportedly haunted the building ever since, with strange noises, cold spots, drafts, and doors suddenly opening and closing. Residence Hall resource manager Maria Molina advises students, you have to be playful with Molly, not afraid. Say, don't play with me, Molly, and you'll be fine. The McCarran Park Pool in Brooklyn opened in 1936 and closed for repairs in the 1980s, never reopening as a pool. Legend has it that a little girl drowned there and now haunts the grounds, calling for help. Though there's no official record of anyone dying at the pool, witnesses claim to see her ghost. The area has been renovated for events, but the pool remains closed. These are just a few of the many haunted locations in New York City. With its rich history and vibrant past, it's no wonder the city's filled with ghostly tales and eerie legends. It's no wonder it's known as the city that never sleeps. On the morning of February 10, 1990, police received an emergency call about a shooting at a bowling alley in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Police and firefighters quickly arrived at the scene. Inside, they found that seven people, including four children, had been shot and killed. The bowling alley's office had also been set on fire. All these years later, police still haven't figured out who committed this terrible crime. A few people saw the shooters, but the two men who likely did it have never been caught. The police and the families of the victims still hope that someday the case can be solved and the killer is brought to justice, even after so many years. On Saturday, February 10, 1990, 12-year-old Melissa Rapace and her friend, 13-year-old Amy Hauser, were at the Las Cruces bowling alley in New Mexico. They were standing by the vending machines when two men entered through unlocked doors. The men pulled out guns and led the girls to the back office, where Melissa's mother, Stephanie Senak, was counting receipts. They also took the bowling alley's cook, Ida Holguin, as a hostage. The gunmen demanded money, and Stephanie opened the safe for them. They took between $4,000 and $5,000 and seemed ready to leave, but the situation quickly turned much darker. The bowling alley was set to open at 9 a.m. for a youth bowling league, and Stephanie Senak, the manager, had arrived around 8 a.m. with her daughter Melissa and Amy. The girls were helping Stephanie open the building and were planning to watch some of the employees' children. Ida Holguin was in the kitchen preparing food for the league. Shortly before the men arrived, Stephanie's brother, Steve Senak, stopped by to pick up his backpack. He told her to lock the doors after he left, but she didn't get the chance. As the gunmen emptied the safe, 26-year-old Stephen Terran, the bowling alley's technician, entered with his daughters, 6-year-old Paula Holguin, no relation to Ida, and 2-year-old Valerie Terran. Stephen brought his daughters to work because he couldn't find childcare that day. Seeing no one in the building, Stephen went to the office and encountered the hostage situation. He tried to fight the men but was overpowered. The gunmen then forced the seven victims to lie down on the floor and shot them all in the head, execution style. Each victim was shot multiple times, including the children. After the shooting, the gunmen gathered papers, stacked them on a desk, and set them on fire. Police believe they were trying to destroy any evidence, thinking all the victims were dead. Despite being shot five times, Melissa Rapace managed to crawl to a phone and dial 911, a skill she had learned just a few weeks earlier. In her harrowing 911 call, Melissa calmly explained to the dispatcher that she and six others had been shot and that the office was on fire. She ended the call by saying, please hurry, there's a bullet in my head. Five responders arrived within minutes, but Stephen Turan, Paula Holguin, and Amy Hauser were pronounced dead at the scene. Valerie Terran was rushed to the hospital but died less than an hour later. Stephanie Senek spent 11 days in the hospital and survived although she died several years later due to complications from the shooting. Ida Holguin also survived, but spent six months recovering in the hospital. 
Steve Senek told police he saw two Latino men near the bowling alley as he left that Saturday morning. The surviving witnesses also described the men as Latino, one around 30 years old and the other 45 to 50. Neither of the men wore masks or gloves, suggesting they didn't expect anyone to be at the bowling alley that morning. Sketches of the men were widely distributed and roadblocks were set up in the area, but no one was ever able to identify them. Police said any DNA evidence the men left behind was destroyed by the fire and the process of putting it out. During an interview for the 30th anniversary of the massacre, Stephen Tarrant's brother Anthony expressed frustration that the killers were never found. In this day and age, he said, things like this don't go unsolved. How did we not get these guys? That's the question I ask myself every day. Audrey Martinez Tarrant, the wife of Stephen and mother of Paula and Valerie, said in 2021 that if she could speak to the man who murdered her family, she would let them know not only what they did to me, but to our community. Taryn and her extended family still hold vigils for Stephen, Paula, and Valerie. As the investigation unfolded, law enforcement explored multiple theories and suspects. Some claimed that R.J. Senek, who worked as the bowling alley's bartender, was involved in drug deals while on the job, but no link was found between R.J. and the murders. Police also investigated Ron Senek, the owner of the Las Cruces Bowl, after discovering the bowling alley was $1.5 million in debt. Ron had also been living at the bowling alley but was out of town the weekend of the shootings. Some found it odd that he reopened the bowling alley just six days after the murders, but he eventually sold it a few months later in December 1990. Despite being referred to as a cold case, the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre remains an open investigation. Lieutenant Casey Mullins of the Las Cruces Police Department LCPD, told the Las Cruces Sun in 2016, this is still an open first-degree murder case, and the statute of limitations will never run out on these murders. There's still a $25,000 reward for anyone who can provide information that helps bring the perpetrators to justice. Detective Amador Martinez told CNN that the LCPD usually receives tips around the anniversary of the massacre, and they actively pursue them. Martinez also has faith that advances in forensic technology may ultimately lead to identifying the killers. I'm a firm believer in forensics, he said in a 2020 interview. I believe something that we have, something that was collected in 1990, will allow us to tell the story of what happened. Unfortunately, we haven't come across it yet, but that hasn't stopped us from doing it. The Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre remains one of the most tragic and haunting unsolved cases in New Mexico's history. So many years later, the victims' families and the community still hold out hope for justice. With advances in forensic technology and the determination of law enforcement, there is still a chance that the killers will be brought to justice, providing some much-needed closure to those affected by this senseless act of violence. Coming up, imagine dancing non-stop for days, weeks, or even months, all for a chance to win food and money during the Great Depression. Dance marathons pushed contestants to their physical and mental limits, turning a simple competition into a shocking spectacle of endurance and desperation. And the savage Beast of Gévaudan rampaged across the French countryside between 1764 and 1767 and killed as many as a hundred people. The true nature of the attacks and the creature itself still remain a mystery. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie, or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. 
Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. One of the most controversial forms of entertainment in U.S. history, dance marathons, saw participants dancing continuously for days, weeks, and sometimes months for a chance to win food and money. In the 1920s, the revival of the Olympic Games sparked a massive interest in impressive feats of strength and endurance, leading to the rise in popularity of dance contests that lasted for extended periods. In 1923, dance instructor Alma Cummings set a world record for dancing continuously for 27 hours. However, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, dance marathons became more extreme. Contestants danced for days or even weeks to win much-needed cash prizes as people struggled to put food on the table. The rules of Great Depression-era dance marathons were strict. Contestants had to keep moving to be counted as dancers and were given 15 minutes of rest per hour. During rest periods, nurses massaged their feet and they could use the restroom. Food and water were usually consumed while dancing, and tasks like bathing, shaving, or reading the paper were also done on the dance floor. Competitions were closely monitored, with contestants accompanied by promoter staff during walks or trips to the bathroom. One of the most important rules was that a competitor's knees could not touch the ground, which would result in disqualification. This is why many photos from such competitions show dancers holding their partners up while they dozed off, keeping their knees from touching the floor. Partners took turns sleeping for a few minutes, and changing partners was allowed if the original one could not continue. It wasn't uncommon for dancers to move continuously for hundreds or even thousands of hours, making exhaustion one of the main attractions. Smelling salts, hard slaps, and even ice baths were used to wake up tired participants. Unfortunately, these methods did not prevent the dangerous side effects of exhaustion and sleep deprivation. Psychosis sometimes set in after tens or hundreds of hours of continuous dancing. In one documented case, a woman's husband punched her in the jaw during a psychosis episode. She attempted to take her own life after dancing for 19 straight days, taking a punch from her husband and only placing fifth in the marathon. Another time, a 21-year-old man collapsed and started vomiting blood after days on the dance floor. As more people discovered the tragic side of dance marathons, cities around the United States began banning them. These competitions had risen to prominence during a time when people found comfort in watching others struggle, but they had become gruesome spectacles. By the late 1930s, dance marathons began to die out, having registered some of the most shocking records in history. For example, Callum de Villiers and Vani Kuczynski of Minneapolis took first prize in a marathon in Somerville, Massachusetts, after dancing for 3,780 hours over five months. Vaudeville star June Havoc once danced continuously for 3,000 hours or more than four months while sleeping only in 15-minute intervals. Dance marathons faded into obscurity by the 1940s as people's attention shifted to World War II. People were returning to work and didn't have time to watch others endlessly move on the dance floor until they collapsed from exhaustion. Moreover, such spectacles had already been banned in most major cities. Today, dance marathons are largely forgotten, with only bizarre photos showing people holding their sleeping partner's knees from touching the floor as proof of their existence. But if your great-grandparents are still alive, you might ask them if they ever cut a rug to the point of exhaustion. In June 1764, Jean Boulet, a 14-year-old shepherd girl, was tending livestock in the wooded valleys near the Allier River in the Gévaudan region of central southern France. Her badly injured body was later discovered the victim of an apparent wolf attack. At that time, her death did not seem unusual. Children often shepherded sheep or cattle by themselves, and wolves were a common hazard of rural life. 
However, more fatalities soon followed, each more gruesome than the last, with severe injuries, dismemberments, and even decapitations. Whatever this creature was, it was far more ferocious than a regular wolf. As whispers of a werewolf began to circulate, the deadly creature became known as La Bette, or the Beast. The Beast of Gevudan terrorized the region for three years, killing as many as 100 people, although some sources claim the total could be as high as 300. Between 1764 and 1767, more than 100 wolves were killed in Gevudan, but scholars are still trying to determine if any of them was the deadly beast responsible for the attacks. The historic Gevudan County, situated in the rugged highlands of the massive central, straddles France's Auvergne and Languedoc regions. It is a dramatic, forbidding land of dense forests and rain-drenched plateaus. Gevudan had once been prosperous, but the wars of the 16th century had battered the rural economy. Many locals were extremely poor and subsisted by herding livestock. After Boulay's death and the following half-dozen cases, young shepherds banded together in groups, but the beast was not deterred by their numbers. The savage attacks continued, mostly taking the lives of women and children. By the fall of 1764, word of the terrifying monster had spread far beyond Gévaudan to the rest of France. The beast became a national obsession, thanks to the editor of the Courier de Avignon, François Morenas. The end of the Seven Years' War with Britain in 1763 had caused a news drought for Morenas. Successful in peddling sensationalist stories, Morenas printed tales of the Beast of Gévaudan to boost the newspaper's sales and spread word of the creature around the nation. These attacks generated dread, which was stoked further by the dramatic reporting of Morenas's correspondence. One report attributed astonishing swiftness to the beast. Another said that it had the gaze of a devil. Others reported that it possessed the intelligence of a wily, robust, and skilled gladiator. By late 1764, Morenas's publication was comparing the beast to the mythical Nemean lion and other terrifying monsters. In addition to horrific accounts of the beast itself, the newspapers also printed survivors' stories. In January 1765, a group of pre-teens held the creature at bay with sticks. In another incident in March, Jean Jovet fought to protect her three children. One of them, aged six, died from his injuries. One of the most famous stories was of Marie-Jean Vallée, the maiden of Gévaudan, who fought the beast off, wounding it in the chest with a bayonet. For some, the challenge to catch the beast represented a good career move and a shot at redemption. A local military captain, Jean-Baptiste Dumel, recruited thousands of local people to help him hunt down the beast in the fall of 1764. Based on reports of a long black stripe down its back, Dumel speculated that the beast was not a wolf but a big cat. This animal is a monster whose father is a lion, it remains open what the mother is. Despite his best efforts, Dumel failed to capture the monster. By early 1765, the continuing Gévaudan drama had attracted the attention of King Louis XV. He rewarded the group of boys who had fought off the beast with sticks and gave their leader a free education. In March, the king sent his own hunters to trap the beast. A renowned Normandy wolf hunter, Jean-Charles Fabocel de Anval, was appointed to head the mission, but he too was unsuccessful. Rattled by his appointee's lack of progress, Louis XV sent his bodyguard, the veteran soldier Francois Antoine. On September 21, 1765, Antoine's men killed a large wolf that they believed to be the beast. The body was sent to Paris, and Antoine was rewarded. Two months later, however, the attacks resumed. Between December 1765 and June 1767, as many as 30 more fatalities were reported. Fear stalked Gévaudan once again, except this time the locals were on their own. Embarrassed by their failure, the authorities paid little attention and even the newspapers had lost interest. On June 19, 1767, local hunter Jean Chastel shot and killed a large animal. From then on, the attacks stopped. Witnesses described the fallen creature as a wolf, but a strange one. It had a monstrous head and a coat of red, white, and gray that hunters had not seen on wolves before. In the following centuries, different explanations were investigated as to the cause of these horrific deaths in the Gévaudan region. 
One of the more popular theories was supernatural in origin. The werewolf. Science has ruled that one out, but the legend lingered for many years, perhaps because of the rumor that Chastel shot the Beast of Gebudon with a silver bullet. Recent theorists have speculated that a serial killer could have been at work in Gebudon who employed some sort of animal to help them kill their victims. However, most experts think this idea is too far-fetched. The answers with the most support come from the animal world. Others suggest the beast could have been an escaped creature that was not native to France, like a hyena. Biologist Carl Hans Take has recently argued that the beast was an escaped juvenile male lion whose immature mane would have looked strange to inhabitants of the French countryside. According to Take, the lion eventually died after eating poisoned bait, which had been placed throughout the Gévaudan region. Historian J. M. Smith has proposed a less exotic theory. The Beast of Gévaudan was rather likely to be several large wolves. The distorting lens of the press and subsequent national hysteria created the Beast of Gévaudan and the hype that went with it. Writing more than a century after the last attack, Robert Louis Stevenson, future author of Treasure Island, was traveling through Gévaudan and described his dismay at how the world was changing. This was the land of the ever-memorable beast, the Napoleon Bonaparte of wolves. Now that the railroad was arriving, you may not meet with an adventure worth the name. The modern world may have crept into Gévaudan, but the true identity of the beast will most likely never be solved to anyone's satisfaction lending a permanent air of mystery to this wild region of the massive central. The legend of the Beast of Gévaudan endures. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories, authors, and sources I used in the episode notes. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And a final thought. You can rarely see the heart of a person in a first-time encounter. Believe the best, but stay wise. Chuck Swindoll. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com listen.